It's been a while. Sorry about that. Last time we looked at the event loop and we saw what it means to call an asynchronous function and what it means for Node.js to be an event-driven platform. We finished the episode by asking an important question. What if you have some operation you want to do, but you don't want it to occur in the current tick? Well, the answer to that question probably won't shock you, but we will visit it in this episode. All right, let's just spill the beans right now. There are three functions available in Node.js to cause something to run on a different tick of the event loop. They are setTimeout, process.nextTick, and setImmediate. SetTimeout and setImmediate are globally accessible functions, and you likely remember them from browser-side JavaScript since they exist in the browser too. Process.nextTick is a node construct, and notice that it's a function called on the globally accessible process object, the same object we can pull our environment variables from. You could sort of just stop right here and already have the tools you need to force something to run on a different tick of the event loop. But these three functions have different semantics, and it's a good idea to understand the differences between them. Now a quick word before we jump into that though. You may be wondering about set interval, which you likely remember from the browser world. It exists in the node world too, and in fact, some enterprising minds at Mozilla used it a few years back to build the very entertaining game Browser Quest. An MMO built with Node? What? Yup. They use set interval to implement a game loop in a Node.js backed server. Now, technically, you could use it for the purpose of scheduling something to run on a later tick of the event loop. However, just like in the browser world, a function scheduled with set interval will continue to fire until it has been cleared out with clear interval. Also, the semantics of this function are all wrong if all you're trying to do is defer execution of a function. Set interval is for things you intend to happen on a regular basis, dare I say, at a regular interval. So know that it's there, but don't use it for the purposes we talk about today. Lastly, please hold all questions about the naming of these functions until we've introduced them all. It'll be a bit wonky, but at least the historical reasons for it will become clear. So let's dive into the deferrals. We look at set timeout first because we knew it in the browser. Its signature is set timeout give it a callback, and give it a delay in milliseconds. SetTimeout is also a globally available function, for better or for worse, so there's no module you need to require to use it. Keep in mind that just as in a browser, calling SetTimeout in Node.js should in no way be understood as a guarantee that callback will execute in exactly time in milliseconds. All it means is that the callback won't happen before time in milliseconds has passed. We'll look at why that is later in the episode. Also, there is a caveat here in that there is a maximum time in milliseconds we can use. Have a look at the relevant node source code, and you'll see that timeouts of longer than 2,147,483,647 milliseconds are set to 1 millisecond. I personally have never used a timeout approaching that number, but do be aware of it. Also, there isn't much point to using a set timeout with a time value of zero. It's likely that one of the other two we get to will actually be what you really mean and more correctly capture your semantics. So let's go on to one of those other two. Process.nextTick has a pretty simple signature. It's just process.nextTick and you give it a callback. The semantics are where this gets interesting. Though the name suggests that callback will run the next time through the event loop, that isn't actually what happens. Any callback queued up by process.nextTick goes into a bucket that gets emptied at the quote unquote next available opportunity. Now what in the light forsaken pit of doom does that mean, you ask? Good question, and keep that queued up because we'll answer it in just a bit. Our last deferral is set immediate. Its signature is similar to process.nextTick. Set immediate, give it a callback. This function's name may just lead you to believe that its callback gets called, say, immediately, but that is not accurate. It actually gets called on the next pass through the event loop. Now we've seen the three deferrals and how to call them, but we don't know the finer details of how they operate. We're going to have to lift the veil and stare into the ether. Node.js uses a library called libuv under the hood. libuv is what makes the asynchronous IO happen in Node.js. At its core, libuv is an event loop, but it's an event loop with different buckets of events, if you will. Let's have a look at the actual code that implements the loop. Here it is. You've got this update time, run timers, and so forth. Now cross-referencing this with a comment from Bed Nordwist. Sorry if I just killed your last name. If it helps at all, 
mine usually gets butchered too. Anyway, we can pick out what our buckets are. In addition to the steps it takes that don't matter to node code, when libuv goes through a take, it does the following. First, grabs a snapshot of the current time for checking timers. It then processes timers whose timeout is before the snapshot time, set timeout and set interval or timers. It then processes any IO callbacks, such as HTTP server requests, file reads, socket connections, etc. Then it does the check handles phase and think set immediate for that phase. As Ben points out in his comment, process.nexttick handling weaves through it all. Now let's call out that snapshot because it explains why the set timeout guarantee is the way that it is. We can see in the libuv code that uv run timers checks its timers against that snapshot, pulling out the ones whose fire time is earlier than the snapshot time. Many things can happen after that snapshot time and before the next pass through the loop, which is why the guarantee is only that the callback won't fire before the given time. All right, let's throw up our three buckets and the libuv event loop, and let's run a little bit of code to see what happens. We'll invoke these examples from the command line so our code is running in the first iteration through the loop. So we just have set timeout, we give it a callback, and a time in milliseconds of zero. Since this is a timer, it goes into the timer bucket. This is the only thing happening this loop, so we go on to the next turn through the loop. At the very beginning, libuv takes a snapshot of the quote unquote current time that will be used throughout the loop. If you've ever done game programming, then this concept will be familiar to you. It then proceeds to check any timers that are ready. Well, since we set our timer for zero milliseconds, guess what? It's ready. So it calls into our callback. And when that's done, we have nothing else scheduled, so the program terminates. Pretty simple. Now, if instead of set timeout, we had this simple program, using a set immediate instead, when we run it, it doesn't look much different. However, under the hood, it functioned differently. Instead of going into the timers bucket, this call went into the handles bucket. Now process.nexttick by itself is going to have much the same result. Again, the bucketing will be different. Process.nexttick gets picked up between each step of our four steps in libuv's event processing. We'll start noticing that though as we weave these calls in with each other. So let's weave them in with each other. First, we'll start by putting them all together. The examples from here on out will be in the episode's code linked in the show notes. This is the file, all three single layer.js. Before we run this, stop and ask yourself, does the order we call these in matter to what the output will be? Let's run it now. We see next tick, timeout, immediately. No, it doesn't matter which order those three calls happen in. Let's step through execution to understand why. Our call to set immediate sends our call to the check handles bucket and execution continues to the next line. Then we schedule a timer with set timeout and move on to the next line. Lastly, we call process.nexttick, which sends our call to that bucket. Our current function then ends, meaning we have nothing left to execute and we head back to the event loop. Well, since we're at a transition point, we start processing any queued up process.nexttick calls. Thus, we see that output. Going through the steps in the loop, we snapshot the current time so that we can check our timers. Then we head into our timers bucket and see if any of them should fire. Our timer was set for zero milliseconds, so libuv will know that this timer needs to fire. It then fires and we see its output. We're again at a transition, but we have no process.nextit calls queued. So we move on to handles. We do have a handle, so we pull it out and fire it and we see its output. At this point, we're through the loop and there are no other possible events scheduled and our program terminates. The calls in that last program only have one of each of the three types of deferrals. Let's see what happens if we add multiple calls. Here's a program in multiplecalls.js. We've got a next tick, an immediate, a timeout, an immediate, a timeout, and a next tick. And with no surprises, the output is next tick one, next tick two, timeout one, timeout two, immediate one, and immediate two. This sets us up for what I call calls at different layers. Now when I say layer, I mean how many levels of callbacks does it take to get to a function? All that we've looked at so far are on the first layer. Let's look at a set immediate that calls set immediate and set immediate empties once per trip.js. Now a quick word on the notation, console log layer one immediate one means that this one was scheduled for the first layer and it's the first one in the code. So what we have are two layer one set immediate calls the first of which queues up another set immediate, 
thus it's the first one on layer two. And the second one sets up a next tick, which is the first next tick on layer two. Now the node documentation for set immediate says, the entire callback queue is processed every event loop iteration. This might lead us to think everything will fire at once. However, it then goes on to say, if you queue an immediate from inside and executing callback, that immediate won't fire until the next event loop iteration. Let's see the output. Layer one immediate one, layer one immediate two, layer two next tick one, layer two immediate one. Let's visualize what happens. First we queue layer one immediate one, then we queue layer one immediate two. Our outer function finishes and we go back to the event loop. We have no other events to process before getting back to checking handles, so we pull out the two set immediate calls that are ready and execute them. It's at this point that we queue layer two immediate one. But since it wasn't ready at the time we checked handles, it isn't in our bucket of things to execute now. Our layer one immediate one callback completes, so we continue to the next one in our bucket, processing layer one immediate two. This queues layer two next tick one and process dot next tick callbacks are interwoven between all the other phases. This means that while we're running our set immediate calls, we won't execute a process dot next tick call until we're done with set immediates for that pass. Well, we just ran out of set immediates because layer two immediate one wasn't ready when we started the phase, this pass through the loop. So we leave the check handles phase, allowing layer two next tick one to execute. Moving on to the next pass then, we can finally execute layer two immediate one. The takeaway here is that recursive set immediate calls will not starve the rest of the event loop. You can safely call set immediate within a set immediate call, and node will only drain one layer per pass through the event loop. Set immediate means run this the next time you go through the event loop, which is one half of our naming quirk. This is a bit different than process.next tick, so let's look at it next. Let's now look at next tick will starve the loop.js. In this program, we queue a process.next tick call, but the callback we supply will queue another one and so forth until we've gone 10 layers deep. On the outermost layer, we also have a set immediate call. Now, if we're recursively queuing set immediate calls, we saw in the last example that they would fire once per pass through the event loop. Let's see what process.next tick does. It goes through all 10 layers deep before yielding to additional events. When libuv starts pulling process.next tick callbacks, it does not save newly added ones for the next phase. And thus we see the odd naming between set immediate and process.next tick. This is a historical quirk and we pretty much just have to deal with it. It's quite important to have two different functions with these semantics, even if I think the name should be swapped. So just remember that recursive process.next tick calls are capable of blocking all other execution, whereas recursive set immediate calls are not. But keep in mind that process.nextTick callbacks only happen on boundaries between phases. Let's see a demonstration of that. Have a look at next tick only happens at boundaries.js. Now the output from this is layer one immediate one, layer one immediate two, layer two next tick one. We saw earlier that all set immediate calls that were ready when we got to the check handles phase fire before we leave that phase. Process.next tick calls are interwoven between phases. Since both set immediate calls were ready at the start of the phase, they all execute before we move on to a phase transition and thus layer two next tick one. Now let's have a look at timeouts drained in same way as immediate.js. We set a timer that schedules a process.next tick callback. Then we set two more timers followed by an immediate. And here is its output with one caveat. Layer one, timeout one, layer one, timeout two, layer one, timeout three, layer two, next tick one, layer one, immediate one. Now just like with set immediate, all the ready timers execute before we leave the timer processing phase. When they're done, layer two, next tick one is able to fire at the phase transition. Finally, layer one, immediate one can process in the handles phase. The caveat I mentioned was that sometimes timers set with a zero millisecond delay aren't quite queued up and ready in time for the very next loop. You know how race conditions can be. And this is one reason why they're a poor choice to defer something until the next loop. Now very quickly, let's modify that last example 
to recursively set up a timer. This is in timeouts do not starve the loop.js. So all we've done is replaced the next tick with another timeout. And we see its output, the layer one timeouts, the layer one immediate, and then the layer two timeout. Just as we'd expect, layer two timeout one is scheduled for a later time than the current run through the loop, so it doesn't fire immediately. Why should we use synthetic deferrals at all? Well, I highly recommend you first read Isaac S.'s article, Designing APIs for Asynchrony, and follow the recursive links in it. Okay, supposing you didn't read that, you get this short summary version. If a function you supply calls its callback asynchronously only sometimes, then you just supplied a function that is hard to reason about and introduces madness. What do you mean, you ask? Well, it turns out that a function taking and calling a callback is not sufficient to make it an asynchronous function. Consider the following contrived example in a callback does not asynchronous make.js. So we just set up this result variable, give it a friendly message. We have another function called not async that takes a callback and returns the value of calling that callback. And we stash that out in result and then we log the result. Now normally, we don't get the data we're after by using the return value of an asynchronous function, but here we're using the return value of a function that takes a callback. Surely that can't possibly work, right? Oh, it says I tricked you. If we follow the call stack, we see that we call into not async, passing it our anonymous function. Now not async immediately invokes our callback, which happens to return a value that not async in turn returns, setting result. Thus, we get our dastardly message, and thus simply using a callback does not asynchrony make. Now one last example. Suppose you have a function that sets up an event emitter. We can see the function in event emitter example no worky.js. We first do the necessary require to get event emitter. The new event emitter function sets up a new instance of event emitter. It defines a function that in our case only emits a single event, but you could imagine this being a function that sets up a steady flow of events that require reaction from the rest of the system. New emitter then calls go and finally returns the emitter. We then call new emitter and attach an event listener to the emitter returned. And what do we see when we run this? Nothing. Uh-oh. Our critical event goes uncaught. Now if catching that event would have led to the happy message that our customers will not bail, then there is at least the possibility that now the customers will bail. Think about how you might change this bit of code so that we would have caught this critical event. I'm going to pull in academia and leave that as an exercise for the viewer. Wow, this one was a bruiser. It is very likely that for the most part you won't need to think about the event loop at this level of detail. So why do it? Well, every abstraction is leaky at some point. If you spend most of your time at level n of abstraction, then I think there's merit in at least understanding level n minus 2 of abstraction. Node is entirely based on the event loop, and a deeper knowledge of its operation will help you when you encounter hard to debug situations. So go forward and work much awesome, and until next time, happy coding.